Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, this is painless design handoffs, and I, I, I first want to say that like I am so excited to be in person. Uh, for me, virtual conferences don't quite do it, so thank you all for being here. Um, who are you? So my name is Jen Wachowski. Um, I'm an associate design director. Uh, I currently live in Buffalo, New York, and right now the weather's kind of the same. So we've had 70 degrees, and now we just dropped down to 30. I got photos of snow from my parents and my sister. So uh, kind of happy to be here in rainy Portland where the weather's kind of nice. Um, but I like things, uh, anything doing with the outdoors. So I love camping, hiking. Um, I love bonfires. I love gardening. Um, and because I'm a designer, I also like all things pretty. Where are you, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> so I am uh, Mike Herschel. I live in Gainesville, Florida. I also like being outside. And I am a senior front end developer. Uh, we also, uh, we are two of the guilty parties in doing the Olivero theme for Drupal 10. Jen was the primary designer, and I'm the primary dev on that. So we've, we've done a bit of work. We're uh, former co-workers, but now we're not co-workers. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, I still currently work for Lullabot, um, and if you're not familiar with Lullabot, basically uh, we're a company that specializes in creating websites for clients that need uh, lar that have large content needs. Um, and now, do you, who do you work for, Mike? I work for AVB Digital. AVB Digital is an organization, and we, we do federal websites. So right now, I'm working on the Small Business Administration's website. So in this talk, we are going to talk about front-end pain points. This is like the airing of grievances for me, like if you know like the whole Seinfeld reference. Uh, Jen's going to talk about some solutions for those. We're going to talk about documentation and tooling to kind of help us out with that. So here is my time to shine. This is the, the, these are the things that uh, kind of drive me a little bit bonkers as I'm doing, as I'm doing work. Um, so the biggest, by far, the thing as a front-end developer that I run into that kind of kind of makes me not happy is uh, lack of consistency. So this particular sh screenshot right here is we have some documentation and then we have a design. And w like, if you were to look closely at this, you're going to see that the documentation and the design have two different things. You know, the font is one thing, and there's a couple a couple different issues right here. And so like. When I get this as a developer, it, it, I have to think through there, you know? I think, like, is this a mistake, you know? Because designers are people, too. And, um, you know, people, people make mistakes. Or I think of this, if this is, is, if this is intentional, do I abstract this? You know, is this a variation on a heading um, that I need to do it? Or do I just kind of create a one-off? Like when I'm writing my styles, do I just like say like this is this font size and I add a little comment in there that says this is a one-off? Or do I just go in and modify the design or modify the documentation? You know, like it, it takes a lot of effort for me to kind of go through there. And um, Something else that I see is I, what I call like the willy nillies, and that's where where designers will just kind of eyeball stuff, you know. And and I get to cases where like the spacing spacing is inconsistent. Does this need to be 43 pixels? Does this need to be 59 pixels? Is the line height correct? You know, um, I go through all these things, and at the end of that, I'm kind of like, well. You know, how do I do this? What do I do? And and we're going to talk about solutions on this, but I'm going to have a couple more. I have a couple more grievances for you, Jen. Um, so something that I I see pretty often is when designs create like have optimal content in there, and you know that when you, your designs will look beautiful because they have optimal content, but as soon as your content editors get in there, what do they do? They immediately try to screw stuff up. So like. As a developer, it is up to me to make sure whatever they do, it needs to the, it needs to work. You know, so so in this particular case, you can see the design on the uh, left hand side has a, a very nice short name. On the right hand side, we see a name that could be a little bit more realistic. You know, and so I have to I have to think things through. I have to say like. There's a grid there. Does does this name need to be in the grid? Uh, can it just wrap? Uh, we can we can enforce a character limit. You know, can you imagine if you're typing your name, it says no, your name's too long, but but we can do that. Um, you know, I could also like 
do the little ellipsis and do like a little CSS clamp there. Uh, in, in different situations, that might be appropriate, you know? So, yeah, so it, it makes me have to think. Uh, something else that I kind of run into fairly often is multiple or unknown font providers. So for y'all that don't know, like w when your website pulls down a font, it takes a little bit of time. It can slow down your website. And when you um, use a third party license font, sometimes they make you run like a little bit of JavaScript to like track maybe your page counters and stuff like that. That also takes a little bit of time. And um, it, it, can, it can slow down your website. In addition to that, like it costs a little bit of money. And I've had literally, I, I've had cases before where, where designers will, they'll give me a design and it has this font. And I said, well, how are we going to pay for this font? This font costs money. It should not be up to the developer to research where should I buy this font? What license should I get th for this font? Th you know, uh, in my mind, I also think like, can I just swap this font out for another similar font? And I've done this before. I've talked to a designer and said, hey, this font is very similar to this font, and then we can do it, and I won't have these issues. But once again, all of this stuff kind of takes time and takes effort, you know? And you all know, like, time is money. Like, if the, de if the development process is smooth and goes straight forward, it goes quicker. That saves everybody money. Um, Documentation, like a show of hands here, if you're creating designs, who here creates documentation with the designs? So for any like record recordings right here, that was a very pitiful showing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what I love to see uh, when, when, when I have a design is I wanna see a list of the headings. I wanna see, I, I wanna see how things fit together. Because let me tell you, if there is no documentation, you know who's creating the documentation? I am. Because I need to abstract these things out. I need to look at the headings. I need to figure out how many variations are there of H2s. Uh, where are they used? I, you know, and at the end of it, it involves spreadsheets. You know, and I'm, I'm a front-end developer, and I don't mind working with spreadsheets, but at the same time, like, we all want to save our clients time and money, you know? And I might be doing something wrong, you know? All together, it makes me feel like that guy. That guy, he was a former coworker of mine who didn't have documentations with a design. <laughs> so, um, Jen, what the hell? <laughs> I am so sorry, Mike. <laughs> We definitely don't want Mike hurting himself, uh, smacking his head against the wall, and we definitely don't want him breaking his computer because we need Mike to build out our designs. So we want to make sure that we're trying to make his job as easy as possible. Um, in the past, we've, we've learned together on how to do this. Um, so, you know, we've made all of these mistakes, and it came through like Slack messages, and sometimes it got to the point where Mike would ping me, and I'd be like, I don't want to answer this right now, because I know I had done, uh, I hadn't uh, done uh, proper documentation, or he had a question, or he ran a co uh, across a content entry issue where the design wasn't fitting to the content. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about solutions. Uh, the first thing I'm going to tackle is creating consistency. Um, a lot of what Mike had mentioned has to do with creating consistency within the designs that we create. Um, and this is also followed up with documentation, because documentation is very important, because we don't want Mike also working in spreadsheets. Um, spreadsheets are not fun. So, before I get into uh, design consistency, or creating design consistency, I did want to point this out. Um, basically, design consistency, um, it's harder to maintain as your team grows. So smaller teams, it's pretty easy to uh, create consistent designs because you only have one or two designers creating those designs. But as you have like five or 10 designers jumping into a project, maybe it's a fairly large project, again, <laughs> it takes uh, more people are touching the designs, inconsistency can happen pretty quickly. So I have this uh, quote by Jeff Bezos, uh, if a team cannot be fed by two pizzas, then that team is too large. Um, I can eat a whole pizza, so I don't know how true this quote is, but I thought it, uh, it kind of communicated the fact that the larger the team, the more time you may have to put into creating a process uh, for designers for creating consistency. So I'm going to talk uh, about 
creating consistency. A lot of this is going to have to do with setting up a design system, but this isn't a design system talk, so I'm not going to get deep into the weeds. But you are going to hear some terms that are related to design system. Uh, I'm going to talk about naming systems and how naming systems can help create uh, design consistency, especially when naming things between designs and components and then passing that along to front-end developers. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about design tokens. These are fairly new. Uh, when I say new, like the past like three, four years, they've become a little bit more popular and design tools have incorporated plugins for designers to uh, be able to use these. I'm going to talk a little bit about grid systems and how we can be more consistent in setting up our grid systems and also our type systems and creating components, symbols, styles, and shared libraries within the tools that we use to create our designs. So I'm going to start off with naming systems. Um, naming systems, as I mentioned, can apply to both how we as designers name things in our uh, designs, so components or colors or our type systems, but it also can be passed down to front-end developers and how they name things in the front-end code. So I am going to uh, just mention that naming things is very, very difficult. Um, it'll take some time to do this. Um, I was talking with a designer a, a few weeks ago, and basically we had come to the conclusion that naming things is really hard. Um, designing things is the easy part. Um, but coming up with a consistent naming system can be pretty difficult. So you might want to reserve some time to do this, and it's okay if it takes a little bit longer than what you had originally planned. You also want to make sure that it's a shared vocabulary with everybody on your team, but especially the developers and the designers, um, because they're going to be going back and forth a lot um, with the naming system. You also uh, want to create and document um, some way uh, how these components or styles are being named. Um, so in the past, we have kind of set up like a Google Doc like a design dictionary that has these names incorporated in it. Um, I may know what a CTA is because I've been on the project for a while, but if you're onboarding a new designer on, they may not know what a CTA means. Um, and by the way, a CTA means call to action. Um, so if you're using words or naming that uh, not everybody on the team knows, they can go ahead and reference this design dictionary to get the names that they, uh, that they need. Um, the best approach is Obviously, to come up with a naming system before you start designing. However, your naming system will probably change as the design evolves because you'll find some gaps. And that's absolutely OK. It's OK to change things because, you know, as you're building out multiple pages, you may find gaps in the naming system and may have to change them. Um, you just make sure when that, the changes happen that everybody on the team is aware of those changes so the naming can be continued in a consistent man uh, manner. So I'm going to have Mike kind of start, of start us off an example. Um, we recently went through this process um, with Olivero and updating the naming system for colors in Olivero. And I'm going to have Mike take this off. Yeah, I'm really excited about this because I think it's like something that has kind of solved uh, some of our naming woes in past projects. And like we started this with Olivero, and I've taken it to various different projects. So basically, the gist of this is you, you'll have a, you'll have a list of colors, right? And so people might start with like a, you know a blue, and then they might say blue light. And then they say uh, blue dark. And then b before you know it, there's a blue lighter. And then there might be a blue lightest. And then there might be blue lightester. And and y'all y'all like know how this goes. Blue lighter dash one. And um, who here has a blue lighter dash one? <laughs> More people than do documentation. And <laughs> so um, this is a very common problem. Like everybody runs into this. So what we ended up doing is we ended up kind of doing like a rough uh, map of the name to the um, to the uh, the luminosity in in the value. So like if y'all don't like know, you, you'll have a color, right? You'll have you know whatever hex value, but there's another format called HSL, which stands for hue, saturation, luminosity. 
And you can go online, type in like HSL converter or something like that, and it converts it. And it's three values for the hue, the luminosity, or saturation, then luminosity. The luminosity is really how bright it is. So what, what, we're, what we do is we name the color based on how bright it is, you know, kind of roughly. So if you have a blue, you will name it, and it has a luminosity of, say, 62, you can name that thing blue 60. Blue 60. Don't name it 62 because the luminosity might roughly change. And this is really interesting because in addition to like providing some standardization and a way to do this, you will find out like, hey, I have two color blues here. One is a luminosity of 61, the other is a 62. I wonder if I can just consolidate these. And I can tell you when we did, when we did this with Olivero, we did consolidate this. And that, that kind of makes the code base like a lot nicer, you know, it's less variables, it's less things for you to mentally comprehend. And anything, any time that we can do that is a big win in my opinion. And, and it also like gives, it gives a consistency for us. Like if you see blue, if you blue 60, you have an idea in your head what that's gonna look like without even like trying it out. So yeah, once we uh, had, uh, once Mike had changed um, all of the color names in the front end code and we had found the ones, which there were multiple, I was surprised on how many were so close. And Mike was like, hey, can we just consolidate these? And I was like, oh yeah. Um, it made our color system, like I think we dropped like seven colors. Um, a lot of them were grays too, um, because with grays, uh, we had grays that we were just uh, pulling out to make more uh, a more accessible gray, because as the design system kind of grew and we were using grays, uh, against different colors, we needed to have more accessible grays to create that contrast ratio. Um, and so we consolidated a lot of colors. And then we went back into our Figma document and we updated all of our naming system to match what uh, Mike had done in the front end. So that way it was more consistent. Um, and that way uh, what Mike was using in the front end, we were also using in our design system. Um, another way to do this is using something called design tokens. Now, I'm not super well versed in design tokens, so please do not ask me questions <laughs> about, you know, troubleshooting design tokens. Um, I'm still learning too. Uh, but design tokens are basically a way to create that consistency between uh, the design files and the front end code when it comes to naming. And so, Basically, uh, definition of design tokens is it's a way to store values of a design. So think about your colors, the values of your typography, your spacing values. Um, all of that is basically aggregated into a JSON file. And um, I'll have Mike explain what a JSON file is because I'm pretty sure he can do it better than I can. Um, but uh, they basically uh, allow teams to better collaborate. So then what you do is you take this JSON file, you pass it along to your front-end developer, or you can sync it up to GitHub. Um, and I know that Figma has uh, a couple of plugins that export this JSON file with the naming system and all the values. And I know Sketch recently also, uh, I think they either natively or have a plugin that also uh, export design tokens. And Mike, can you... Um, can you talk to us about what a JSON file is? Uh, so, the, so developers in this crowd already know this, but a JSON file is basically a text file that could be read in by computers. So, so you could like you could you could define like these are colors and this is the name of a color and then this is the value of that and stuff like that. And it's you can you can read it and computers can read it, and that's that's kind of the value of that. Awesome. So yeah, if you haven't used design tokens, again, great, uh, great tool to use. Um, I'm still experimenting in Figma and how to set these up correctly. Um, but grid systems is another uh, way that designers can create consistency for Mike. Um, and when we think about grid systems, uh, most people or designers think about grid systems as like the horizontal grid. Um, so that is your columns going across. This is the most common that you see. But in one of Mike's examples, there was some odd spacing in between components as, um, they, were, as they were being stacked on the page. And we want to make sure that that uh, spacing is also very consistent. Um, and so we call this vertical rhythm, which is basically um, how things are spaced going down the page and how the user scrolls down the page. And you want to use um, a uh, consistent, consistent spacing for that. Um, and uh, a co past coworker of mine, Maggie Greiner, who used to work at Lullabop, but since has left, um, she wrote this amazing article on techniques on how to do this. 
Um, Designing with Rhythm and Proportion, put a link there. Highly recommend to check it out. Uh, she has some great uh, tips and techniques. You also want to think about with your grid, what is the width and max width? Um, this is something that sometimes I even forget, and uh, Mike used to ping me all the time about. Um, but what is the uh, max width of your grid? Where do things stop scaling in width? Or are there specific components that actually take up the full width of the grid system? Um, and break out of that grid system and actually become the full width of the browser. You also want to set up your grid system for uh, multiple breakpoints because they will change from desktop down to mobile. Um, and so if you're new to grid systems, uh, the best grid systems are multiplied by two. Uh, 12 and 16 are the most column grid systems because they are uh, the most flexible when it comes to desktop grid systems. You also want to think about your typography. Um, so a technique that we use with setting up our type systems is we just come up with a bunch of typography um, and type scales. Um, and then we, at the very beginning of the project, and then we revise as we go along. Because your type system and your type scale is going to change as you find the gaps um, and as the design system grows. A uh, really cool tool that we use, it's something called module scale. I put a link here. Uh, and uh, what it is, is module scale is a way to set up a type scale system pretty quickly using um, ratios. Um, so you can pretty quickly, uh, based on the ratio that you put in and your base font size, like you can put in a base font size of 1M, and it'll give you um, different options for your type scale. You also want to think about the margins around the typography. Specifically, if you have like two paragraphs, what are the margins or the padding in between those two paragraphs? What happens if you take a paragraph out and you stack it on top of an image? You know, does the padding stay the same? Is it different? Mike is going to ask these questions if he doesn't know. Now let's talk a little bit about components, uh, styles, and shared libraries. These are things that you are going to create in the design tools that you use. Um, so just a little FYI, Figma calls, com uh, calls these components, um, Sketch calls them symbols. Uh, I'm going to use components for the sake of this talk, um, but it means the same thing. Um, so basically, you, in your Sketch or your Figma documents or your design tools that you're using, you can usually set up a design library or component library or a style library. Um, and basically, what you do is you can create these libraries and create reusable components. Um, and then you can take those components and uh, pull them directly from the library for designers to use. Um, you can also create bespoke components, which means that these one-off components that aren't really uh, reused in the design system, they might be uh, just like show up in the About Us page or on the home page. But when you do create those bespoke components, make sure you add some documentation for Mike because uh, he will want to know that those are not mistakes. <laughs> so components, the great thing about components is that they create the central source of truth for all designers. So um, if you update a master component, say you change off the background color um, and save it, um, it'll, those uh, changes will push down to um, all of the pages and all of the files that are linked to that style or component library. Um, you can also create overrides pretty easily. So if you, know, you have a component that uses a black background, but on a specific page you want to use a gray background, um, you can go ahead and do that pretty easily. Again, document that for Mike so he knows it's not a mistake. And again, the great thing about components is they help create more consistency in our designs. So instead of copying and pasting, copying and pasting, um, you can just pull right, right from the component library um, and uh, updates um, are stay pretty consistent because you just change the master component. With style libraries, you can set these up early on too. Um, so start at the very beginning so there is a library for all designers to pull from. Uh, again, this will probably change as the design evolves. Uh, as uh, in the past, we've had our colors change uh, pretty quickly in the design process because we find accessibility issues with them. Um, but that's absolutely okay because they work similarly to components. Uh, so does typography. So you set up your 
colors and typography of shared styles. Kind of works like the same thing with a master component where you change out the master color and it um, updates across the board wherever that color is being used. And again, I cannot stress enough about how much I love shared libraries. Uh, I share them all the time. You know, it's very easy to share them with designers because designers can link directly to the component library. Um, you can put links in your documentation to these libraries. Um, and anything that we hand off to Mike, um, we usually um, add links to uh, the shared libraries for Mike to access. Um, and we also sometimes share them with stakeholders and other adopters that are outside of the project team. So when it comes to documentation, there may be specific things that um, Mike might not, uh, might, Mike might not know. Um, and so we're gonna create like that extra layer of documentation for him. And so with our documentation, I'm just gonna go back here because this fast forwarded way too quickly for me. Um, we're gonna document our style guide, patterns, and additional functionality because if he's jumping into a Figma file, he might not know like things are supposed to be sticky or how uh, animation is supposed to work within the design system. Um, and so we're gonna add that extra layer for him to hand that off to him so he pings, pings us less So when it comes to asking questions. So I love the uh, photo that Mike pulled for Ice Cube, but I found this quote, uh, truth is the ultimate power. When the truth comes around, all the lies have to run and hide. So basically, when Mike finds any inconsistencies in the designs, he can go to the documentation to figure out if uh, those inconsistencies are part of the design system or if they are um, mistakes pretty easily. So. so in our style guide, we typically document our type systems, uh, grid systems, colors, and spacing. And the reason why is because it's basically a document that we can just hand off the mic and he can really quickly scan and set up all of the type systems um, and all of this basically without clicking around the designs to kind of get those values. Oh, one other thing too is we often include our design principles and personas in here because a lot of times we'll hand the style guide off to um, higher stakeholders. And it's nice to have those personas and design principles in there because uh, it creates a nice uh, reference for how these styles and uh, spacing and everything kind of came about. This is just an example of a style guide. Uh, we often use Google Docs for this because several designers can jump in and uh, create and uh, create the style guide. But as you can see here, uh, we document our type system, we document our grid system, um, and we also add uh, handy links at the end uh, for our front end developers to kind of jump into anything like, for instance, typography. <laughs> you know, we want to make sure Mike has those links to where uh, he is, where we're grabbing our fonts from. Um, and so a lot of times what will happen is designers will actually, if we have to purchase the fonts, we'll purchase the fonts ahead of time and we'll put them in a Dropbox folder or a box folder for him to access those fonts. Uh, we also want to uh, document our patterns and components uh, separately. Um, and when it comes to our patterns and components, this includes our colors, uh, our layouts, and our type treatments. Um, and here's an example that we've done for Olivero. Um, on the right-hand side is uh, some extra documentation that we added for the header, just because there's lots that happens in the header. Um, you know, we have a, if we have a sticky header, what does it happen on scroll down? How does the design change? Um, you know, what do drop downs look like in navigation? Um, on the right-hand side, or on the left-hand side, we have a documentation for input labels. Uh, and these are super important because I found in the past that several designers don't even like, uh, don't know all of the states that uh, input labels could have. So a lot of times Mike would ping me and be like, so like, what is the focus state supposed to be? And I was like, oh, it's the same as the hover state. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> let's, let's hop on a Slack call and talk. Um, and so, uh, you know, we document basically our error messages, you know, what does a checkbox look like when it's checked? What does it look like when it's disabled? Um, all of this Mike can get really quickly and just scanning down to make sure that everything's included. And if there's something missing, um, he'll reach out to me. We also have functionality and this we want to document uh, separately. 
Um, so we have prototypes that we can do this with, but those take some extra time. Um, sometimes uh, the uh, prototyping can be too complex for Figma. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes designers don't know front-end code and they can't do this pretty quickly. Uh, in that case, in the past, we've used uh, comments and envision in Figma. Uh, what we found is most popular, though, is creating a functionality spec document. And basically, this is an annotated design uh, that kind of links up to uh, a spreadsheet. <laughs> So yes, <laughs> designers sometimes have to work in spreadsheets. Um, but basically, uh, the numbers match up to functionality that is supposed to happen. So you can document your click functionality, your scroll functionality, or any animation that's supposed to happen. And then uh, this one I actually just added in uh, last second because uh, there are a lot of gripes about file organization. <laughs> Um, developers and other designers even are going to hop into your files at one point. Um, and so it's great if everything's organized. And I am totally um, a person who kind of works messy at the very beginning and then works backwards and cleans, cleans up their files. Um, but basically, try and name your layers um, in a way that is meaningful. Um, you also want to set up a system to let developers or other designers know like what's still in progress versus what has been approved in the design files. Um, so we've used an emoji system in the past, so anything that has a green check mark has been approved. Anything that has a red X is still you know, being worked on or has to still go through the approval process. Um, and finally, it's good to leave any other notes for uh, things that might need to, might, might need to know um, when it comes to extra context with the design, so. So Mike's gonna talk a little bit about communication. You don't want this to happen. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, communication is, is obviously uh, a very, very important. Probably the most important thing that the way that we're going to collaborate, right? So this is this is traditional here, and we've all been there, where a designer will do a whole bunch of work, and they just kind of throw it over, and then they're done. Uh, I've I've been in situations with this, especially with um, external design agencies. Um, we overly communicate, like, and and I highly encourage you to overly communicate too. Communicate during the design process with regular check-ins. That includes wireframe check-ins and things like that. That can identify some issues. Um, like, for example, does Drupal give this to you, give you this functionality, but slightly different for free? Uh, most recently, I had a case where um, our designer was putting together a form, you know, and and it was kind of a filter form, and they had an idea, and I said, well, if you use views expose filters, it will kind of look like this. Would this work? And they were like, that's wonderful, yes. And that saved several hours of development work for us to have to configure those exposed filters to do a different format. And, and that time is money. You know, that, 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 saves our, that saves our client that much money. Um, so bring your developers in for review. And during the development process, too, we're constantly, we're constantly talking. There's always gaps, and that's totally fine. Like, I expect gaps, and to tell you the truth, like, I kind of look forward to these gaps, because it gives me, like, a little, personally, it gives me the opportunity to flex that muscle. What I typically do, and not everybody works this way, if I see, like, for example, a state, like a focus state or an active state that was not documented, I will say, I will, I will do it, make a best effort, and at that point I'll say, hey Jen, what do you think about this? And she will say, well Mike, there's a reason you're not a designer. Or she will say, uh, hey, that's really good, done. You know, and, and more often it's the latter. And, and, and I, 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 like to, I like to find that, you know. There's also all types of pushback. There's always gonna be pushback. You know, designers have a tendency to create uh, text that might not meet accessibility criteria you know like you like to make a website properly accessible text has to have a certain contrast ratio above the background color 
So when we do design, or when Jen does designs, when I, when I co-designs, I do my best to make sure it does that, because I want our websites to, I want everybody to be able to use our website. So, so there's things like that. We talked about similar components. You know, there are cases where like, right now I am, I am working on a project and we have a whole bunch of different card variations. Is this a card? Is that a card? Can we combine these cards? That's a conversation that I've scheduled for when I get back from uh, DrupalCon here. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, can similar functionality be provided by Drupal that's not quite the same? Is that okay? A lot of times the answer is like, heck yeah. And then there might be some minor design elements that impact the timeline. And I don't know, what, like think of like maybe a menu that flies out or, or that does something a little untraditional. Is that important? Is this the type of thing that you and the client 100% uh, want? And if so, that is fine. But keep in mind that might take, you know, three, four hours of development time to put together. You want to talk about tools? Sure. So I'm just going to really quickly go over some of the tools that I had uh, mentioned a little bit earlier that can help with the handoff. Um, when it comes to uh, handing off your designs. But I don't want to call it a handoff because it's not a handoff. Like, we're communicating all the time. Mike's brought in super early into the design process to ask questions, to help us with timelines. You know, some of our ideas are really blue sky, but they may not meet uh, the deadlines that we have. So we want to make sure that we're communicating all of that. Um, so that's why I don't want to say handoff because it typically it's not a handoff. It's more like um, we're not really done yet. But uh, we are uh, at the point where Mike can start development. Um, so a few years back, uh, our design team had moved to Figma. Uh, Figma is a really great design tool because um, you don't have to download the program in order to use it. Um, and we always we had run across this with several developers. Um, in the past, Sketch was only Mac-based, so uh, they couldn't access any of the design files. So we had to use another tool called Envision um, and create a uh, link-based system where we would send sync our designs to Envision, send that link over to Mike, Mike would get that link, and then he could go in and turn on something called the Inspect tool, where he could kind of click around the designs to get all the values he needed for the front-end design. Uh, Figma eliminates that extra step. So Figma is basically a design tool, um, if you haven't heard of it. Similar to Sketch, um, but uh, it is uh, also web-based. So you can download the program or you can use it uh, web-based. It allows everybody to collaborate at once in the file, which is kind of cool, but kind of creepy at the same time. Um, you can see cursors moving. Uh, this morning, I went in to check on the progress of a design file that I'd been working on. I had three other cursors moving in the design file, and I felt I felt like I was kind of creeping in on him. <laughs> so, um, but I can send Mike a Figma link, and he can really quickly just go in and uh, click on everything and get all the values that he needs to start uh, the front end code. There are other couple tools that do something similar that you may have heard of. Um, these used to be pretty popular, but I feel like because of uh, Envision and Figma, they're, they're less popular. Um, but there's Zeppelin and Avacode, which does the same thing that Envision does. So you can basically sync your files to uh, these programs and then send a link to Mike, uh, and then Mike can go in and click around to get the values that he needs to start the front end. Um, we also use Google Docs and uh, Dropbox Paper, which took a second to show up here. Um, the reason why we use Dropbox Paper and Google Docs for all of our design documentation is there's more likely going to be more than one designer creating these. Um, and so we often have several designers going in to uh, uh, finish off the design documentation around um, the design system that we're going to hand off to Mike. Also, too, um, the documentation might change um, as the design system evolves. So it's pretty easy to just go ahead and change it in the Google Doc, Lick, let Mike know. Um, but we don't have to like keep exporting PDFs and uploading them or emailing them. Um, so it helps create more of a living document. So we are near the end of our presentation. Um, all of the resources that we have mentioned are at the end of our presentation here. We aggregated this nice slide for everybody so they don't have to go seeking through the presentation looking for all the links. Um, but uh, if you're curious, the 
link to this presentation is also down at the bottom here. And um, I think, do we have time for Q&A? Yeah, we have, uh, we have about 10 minutes. If you all have any questions, um, we will do our best. Uh, so first of all, thank you. You had your hand up first. Uh, yeah. So, so the question, the question, this is for the recording, is how do the designers deal with nested grid systems? Do you want to answer that? I can try. Um, so typically we try and avoid nested grid systems because in the end there's going to be only one grid system that Mike ha can set up. Is that correct? Like when you're doing your... Yeah, from a front end perspective, um, nested grid systems can be tricky um, because like, like there's, there's some CSS techniques coming out that are going, going to allow us to deal with that a little bit easier, but right now, right, right now there's not. That doesn't mean it never happens, um, but coming from Jen and, and the designers that I worked with, typically they avoid those. But when they happen, they happen and I deal with it. Uh, uh, you and then you next. Yeah. So the question is, uh, should a style guide be publicly accessible on your website? And I, I kind of have thoughts if you want to have thoughts. Uh, so my personal opinion is yes. Um, and the reason why is because there's no, I mean, unless you have some proprietary information in there that you don't want to share out, um, I don't see a reason why um, not to publish it. Um, I know some companies in the past were afraid, like, people might actually, like, duplicate the look and feel of their website, and so they wanted to keep all of the style guide and all that pretty private. Um, but I'm, I'm more for sharing. Like, I, I... I love, personally, I love looking at other style guides and design systems and documentation that other companies have set up as inspiration for how we can make ours better um, when it comes to documentation, so. Uh, I just want to add, I think it would probably keep you more honest, too, you know, so they don't go out of sync. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's another gripe that I could probably put into the slides at some point. So the question is, is uh, in regards to the max width, like how, l like a lot of times, like it's not documented, like how that's going to look, it, and is the, is that hero, is the hero image going to like, say like expand to the whole, the whole width of the site, no matter how wide it is, you know? Am I, am I understanding that correctly? So what, I typically do is I'll like like for me I'm I'll typically just kind of do it you know I'll 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 let it expand even if it's gonna be like kind of like very low resolution but it, I guess it, it really depends on the design <coughs> and things like this might be a situation where I reach out to Jen like because there's a couple different options you could do a repeat you could do you could you could have a a color back there or something like that and I think I think that would be a question for design where I would I would uh, ping you in slack and say hey let me show you this and what do you think yeah and um, so at very early on in my design career I would always be like oh no it's just it should just be the max width of the browser like it should never stop scaling uh, but I learned a couple of things number one uh, the image would have to be fairly large because you know a lot of desktop screens are getting larger and larger. Um, and so, especially if you're showing a website on you know, a screen like this, um, it'll get pretty, <laughs> pretty blown out. And so, uh, I've had in the past developers just go on a call with me and show me what the image looks like or send me a link to see what the image looks like at full width. And you can 
see pretty quickly that the image is pixelated. Um, and then I'd ask, that, well, why can't we just upload a larger image? And the reason why is obviously for performance reasons, because you know, the larger the image, it'll float on the website. And so I've come to the conclusion that uh, basically there is going to be a point where things just stop scaling. Um, and so it might not be apparent on my laptop or on my screen, but there is going to be a max width that I'm going to have to uphold in order to help create um, some, uh, to create more clear images and so nobody sees like a blown out image when it comes to the website, so. Um, so I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, the question is, are there any uh, references or guides for designers to kind of, uh, for, print designers. for print designers to learn web design and all the things that they have to design for? Um, huh. Uh, there's a lot that's out there. I do know that um, there's a bunch of articles that I could, uh, that I could reference, but I don't know the links to them right away. Um, I do know there are some books too. So uh, in the past, I've taught some web design classes where uh, I've actually used a book because the book is actually pretty good. And I've noticed that uh, when you point students to uh, to you know links, they just don't read them. Like, oh, go ahead. Uh, oh no. So uh, the question is, how do we approach ADA? Um, it starts with design, I will tell you that. So all the colors that you choose, the type system that you set up, um, we often run through uh, Contrast Checker, which is plugins that you can use with Figma with accessibility. It'll tell you if the type is too small. Um, and if it is too small, you have to bump up the contrast with the color. Um, and then that also gets passed on to Mike, who um, also has to do a lot of accessibility, um, uh, a lot of accessibility in the front end. Uh, sometimes he'll come back to me and he'll find stuff that I had missed, uh, which is great. He'll be like, oh, you know, this doesn't pass the contrast ratio. And it's like a grade that I had missed. And I was like, okay, we have to go ahead and up. We have to update this color. Yeah, uh, pretty much what Jen said. Um, I created this cool grid that if the internet was working, it would, it would work. It's called contrast grid. Here it comes. And it allows you to quickly evaluate uh, large color systems. And I, I did this. Because I was a lot of fun. Because it was a lot of fun. And what you can do is you can paste in your CSS variables or SAS variables, and you hit a button, and it and it sh will show you the grid right here. And um, this helps you. Th this can help you like really quickly evaluate your colors and 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 how it looks and stuff like that. And so that's at contrastgrid.com. Uh, so th so the answer is like it's a lot of it's on me about keeping the website accessible. I strongly believe in accessibility, um, but there is a, it starts with design. Uh, one more question, person with the green shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, totally. I guess one more question too while I pull that up. Uh, the one in the back there with the plaid? So how do, we, the question is how is the project set up so we have that much, so we have access to our front-end developers and front-end developers have access to our designers, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in the past at Lullabot when we had worked together, uh, they basically overlap in, this, in, the, in the process, they basically overlap uh, the developers with the designers. So there isn't a point where designers actually roll off the project where there isn't uh, a front-end developer that they're communicating with. So usually it was what, like three, four weeks? Um, 
we've also since learned that it, it's also advantageous to have a front-end developer embedded in the design team at the very beginning. So we're actually experiencing, uh, experimenting with using something called a front-end designer is what we're calling it. And basically it's uh, a front-end developer who also knows design um, embedded at the very beginning with uh, the design team to kind of help with that communication and to help with feedback. I also want to kind of talk about people skills. Like, I've worked with designers before that I don't personally know, and they have honestly not made the most optimal designs. And But because I don't know them that well, I, I don't want to go to them and kind of trash on their designs. So you, like, you have to know how to gently push. You have to, you have to, uh, you have to have that feedback. I like to do video calls so you can hear the people's voice inflection and, and stuff like that. But that's, that's a whole nother talk and that's honestly probably the most complicated thing ever is just being able to do that. Um, we don't have time, but like we can hang out out there if y'all have questions and uh, like thank you. Thank you for being in person. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>